What are some of the biggest lies told about investing? That's going to be the topic of today's video. Okay, everyone, if you're an expat in particular or a high net wealth individual, go over to adamfire.com and see how I can help you. Now, in this video, I'm going to talk about some of the biggest lies that people believe about investing. So number one is that investing needs to be risky. Investing is not risky. In fact, investing is much less risky long term than putting money in the bank. So, for example, Ray Dalio, the um, billionaire founder of um, a hedge fund, he mentioned that he thinks cash is the riskiest investment long term because of inflation. And what people often forget is that, take the S&P 500, if you invest in it for one year, your chance of being down historically is 28%. That's not a small figure. Over five years, it's 14%. Over 10 years, it's 10%. But it has never been down over a 25 year uh, time period, um, which is quite um, astounding really. And the US stock market in general has never been down over that kind of long time period, especially if you reinvest dividends, which actually uh, relates to a second point, and that's that the Japanese stock market has performed particularly badly, which is related to the first point. So what a lot of people say is a lot of people who know about the first point will say, well, what about Japan? It's true that when it comes to the US or many uh, you know, developed and uh, our kind of stock markets, they've always gone up long term, but what about Japan? But I've done a video on this before, and I've actually shown where if somebody reinvests their dividends, they would have actually made money in the Japanese market, even if they would have been so unlucky that they invested right at the top. So in other words, somebody who invested right at the top of the Japanese stock market bubble and sold out, say last year or something like that, they would have actually made money assuming they reinvested their dividends because the stock market is similar to property in that there's two ways to make money, capital appreciation and dividends. So in the same way, if you've got a property and it's, I don't know, you bought it for £100,000 and now it's a £70,000. But you know what? If you've got good rental income, you might still make money. And the stock market is the same. So every single major stock market has actually been up over a 30 year period, including the Japanese stock market, if you factor in dividend reinvestment. Okay, now number three, I would say, is the idea that diversification is always a good thing. Now, diversification is a good thing for many people in many situations. That is very true. So if you're retired or near in retirement, you should probably uh, be as diversified as possible. It is also true that diversification lowers your risk in many ways. However, we have to remember that if you're very diversified, that's almost for sure going to lower the return. So for example, if you compare Ray Dalio's Orwera portfolio, which has gold, commodities, stocks, bonds, to say investing 90% in the US stock market or indeed international stock market. What you find is Dalio's uh, portfolio has only been down four times or something like that over 40 years. Whereas the US stock market uh, obviously has been down many years. Uh, but long term, literally you would have made millions more. If you were an old guy who started investing in the 1940s or 1950s, you invested every single month for many people, I'm not just talking about wealthy people, the difference between the two investors would have been outstanding. So uh, obviously diversification can be a good thing, it can be a good tool, especially if you're quite cautious and especially if you're older. But that doesn't mean that uh, diversification is always a free lunch. It's not always a free lunch because unless you can find assets that are gonna perform exactly the same over time, some of the best assets for diversifying your wealth have historically done worse than the US and other major stock markets. So for example, government bonds. Yes, government bonds can sometimes go up when the stock market goes down, but government bonds have never beaten the stock market uh, long term. Likewise, gold and commodities. Gold and commodities have done very well during certain time periods, like 2000 until 2010, when many of them went up by four or five times when the stock market was stagnant. But over a very long period of time, they haven't done that well. So. If you look at the commodity index from say 1800 until now, gold and other commodities have been stagnant at best. They, they kind of track inflation. Even many gold bugs, even supporters of gold, admit that gold is merely a source of value that will kind of hold its weight relative to inflation. But with gold, you're gonna probably make 0.5% above inflation 
at best every year if you hold it for 30 or 40 years. So diversification definitely isn't the be all and end all. And number four is the idea that the stock market is linked to the economy. So for example, developing world, emerging world stocks have actually done worse than developed world stocks over the last 30, 40 or 50 years. Um, likewise, there have been many years where the stock market has done well, but the economy has done badly and vice versa. So there is actually no correlation between the two, especially because, um, you know, these days things are global as well, because even if there was a correlation, let's take the US stock market. I mean, no matter where you are in the world now, if you look out your window, there might be a Starbucks, there might be a Lidl, there might be an Aldi, there might be God knows what else. So these days, especially in the international world, even if there was a correlation, you know, wouldn't really um, affect things. Uh, but there isn't a correlation, as I mentioned. And one of the reasons there isn't a correlation is that ultimately the stock market is just the biggest companies in the world. So basically the biggest companies in the world, obviously it's harder to grow if the economy is not doing well all around the world. But take the Dow Jones, that's just 30 US companies. It's more than possible for the top 30 US companies to do well and smaller companies do badly um, and vice versa. I mean, we saw that during COVID, right? A lot of big companies were making more money than ever, whilst many small companies, but not all, were struggling. And number five is the idea that you can time markets and you can see the future. So basically, one of my favorite quotes from um, Jack Bogle, the founder of Vanguard, was that he said, I've never met anyone who can time the stock market and I've never met anybody who has met anyone who has timed the stock market. Although long term, he's saying, there's many people who got lucky once or twice, but long term, uh, it's almost impossible. And the funny thing is, there's a lot of academic research that's been done about this. And I can remember one of the most um, remarkable, um, you know, episodes of my conversation with uh, Kevin O'Leary last year was when he admitted, I tried to time the stock market, but I failed. And if somebody who's worth 400 billion, 500, sorry, 400 million, sorry, um, if he can't time the stock market, the average DIY investor certainly can't. But it's amazing how many people, despite all the evidence, they'll read an article and they'll say, oh, is this the right time to invest? Is that the right time to invest? And what's interesting is often people don't learn their lessons. So for example, I found the same people in my network who were worried about investing during 2016, uh, during the US presidential election, they were the same people who were worried in 2020. And when I pointed out to them, well, what about four years ago? You were worried and then you shouldn't have been worried. They were like, mm, yeah, but maybe this time is different. And it's amazing how many people, no matter how often they're proven wrong, they still read the same media publications and they still kind of worry about the same things. It reminds me of a quote from uh, Steve Forbes, the, um, uh, the founder of Forbes. He said something like, and I'm paraphrasing here, uh, we rely on the um, uh, short memories of our readers because what he's referring to is if everyone checked out the previous predictions made from a lot of these columnists, basically they would never take their predictions seriously in the future. And the same thing with any media organization. If you went back to CNBC, the Financial Times or any major media organizations, you would find so many wrong predictions. So many times they said, oh, the market's not gonna recover for 10 years or God knows what else. But it's amazing how often people kind of quickly forget these things. So that's the final lie really, that you cannot predict markets, you can't time markets.